G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. In 2001, Craig started on a tractor, then in 2013 became 50% owner. Now he owns almost the entire company after vendor financing from his business partner, Mike, who founded the company in 1996. They provide golf course management, construction, design, and renovation. When the GFC hit in 2008, they went from 40 million US dollars in annual sales to none overnight, with only one of the three large golf course and real estate construction projects eventually being completed. In 2009, they built a bridge through the GFC. They pivoted and started managing golf courses, now with 12 on their books. Craig's vision to build a world-class golf course in the rare sand dunes of Wisconsin right after the GFC, they started building Sand Valley, two 18-hole courses and a par three. With 130 FTE stretching up to 400 in peak summer season and revenue climbing to around 40 million Aussie. They grew organically through profits. He believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is managing time. There is never enough. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Craig Holton from Oliphant Golf Management. Thanks for your time today, Craig. Uh, hi, Troy. How are you? Yeah, good. Um, let's start with how we know each other. It's a bit of a theme on these podcasts, but Greg Ramsey, a good mutual friend of ours, introduced us you've obviously known greg for many many years as i have but you're on the other side of the on the world pretty much there and you're in uh are you wisconsin uh in wisconsin yep yeah great yeah so i think we met in person five four or five years ago when you flew out for greg's 40th uh, birthday in hobart yeah and i um my connection to greg is i met greg when he was um when he was living and working in st andrews for a few years and ended up uh roommates with my good friend, Bill Welter. That's right. Yeah, and Bill, yeah, Bill's been on the cast. He's got a facility there in Michigan, yeah. Yep, so so when Bill and Greg were hanging out in St. Andrews, um, I got to know Greg and then stayed in contact with him um, since we were both working on golf stuff. Yeah. And, and then, you know, yeah, we've been friends for now 20 years. And then, yeah, we met at his uh, uh, birthday party and went to see his golf course in Rantho. And had a great trip. I guess it's been several years now. Yeah, so, I think but, I think he's mid forties, which he doesn't like me saying. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Ratho is the oldest golf course in Australia. I think actually in the Southern Hemisphere. And obviously, um, uh, Greg's passion for golf. He was the you know had the vision for Farm Bootle Dunes in Tasmania, one of the top fifty golf courses in the world, number four all up in Australia, uh, number one public golf course. Yeah, phenomenal uh, vision, reasoning. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And, and, um, and Greg, you know, through our friendship, he's, he's been influential in a lot of things that we've, we've done because he's done some consulting with us. Yeah. And, um, as you know, Troy, and you've worked on some of those things, Yeah. but also the biggest connection to Greg is that he was, uh, the person that ultimately put me in touch with Mike Kaiser and his family, which led to building a very big, um, golf project in Wisconsin called Sand Valley, which, um, you know, in turn has been a big boost for our business and the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I'm really keen to hear about the, um, your journey, as I said before. Uh, one last little connection, because when Bill was on the podcast, he mentioned that uh, you built him a 30,000 foot uh, putting green out the back of his distillery. Is that right? Yeah, it's really neat. Um, he uh, he had a big dead space behind the it is a really historic old factory building that he uses for the distillery. Yeah. And they did deliveries and and might have had an outdoor a little outdoor seating space, but mostly kind of industrial dead space behind. And he had the thought that maybe you could put a putting green back there, and we actually did it. So he, um, you know, we think it's the biggest putting green in the world that's not attached to an actual golf course of some kind <laughs> wow. so, yeah. so I, think, I think that's got to be true but it's huge it's almost an acre and it's um it's wild in the same way um that you know it's modeled after the himalayas in st andrews a, a, a gigantic wild putting course and yeah, it's blessed for families and kids and golfers and yeah, um cool. yeah it's really neat yeah great well tell our audience a bit about your business uh 
what it does, how it makes money? Uh, so our business is golf. Um, we touch a lot of things in golf. Uh, the two, two pieces of the business we'll talk primarily today, I think about the management company, but, um, we started in golf course construction. Um, the, the Mike Oliphant who started the company, um, in 1996, uh, has been a golf course contractor for many years working on very high profile, um, big budget, oftentimes housing development type golf courses for yeah. big name golf course designers. And that was what the company did for a, a long time and did really well. Uh, it, when the financial crisis hit, um, that business went from something like 40 or 50 million to literally zero overnight. It was, that was the GFC people, in 2008? Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Wow. So, yeah. so several of those, you know, we, we had, I don't remember exactly, but we had, um, you know, three or four very large projects going on at once, um, you know, with hundreds of people working on it and millions of dollars in materials and, and all that just completely stopped. And, and I think if I, if I think back, maybe one out of the three that were active, you know, were ever completed, but for the most part, it was just a full stop. Yeah. So, um, so at that time, which was 2008, I guess, maybe 2009, Michael Lafont were looking at each other saying, what are we going to do? And I guess I could back up and, and say that at that time, um, my wife, we moved to Scotland where I met, I said a little bit, I met Greg uh, while I was over there, but I was going to school and getting a degree in landscape architecture. And then I worked for a year on golf courses around London. Um, and then we had, my, my wife and I had to pick a place to move back to. She was a botanist at the time. Uh, and we, so we went to a university that was working on her type of plant, which was the University of Wisconsin. Yep. So that's how we ended up here. Right. And I just looked for it. I just went to look for a job, you know, having come straight off this great experience in Scotland and was fortunate to find Mike Oliphant in Madison, Wisconsin, um, who was a golf course builder, you know, and, and most people listening to this won't know that much about Madison, Wisconsin, but it's a very unlikely place to find a golf course builder. And I did. And what that enabled me to do is to have a job right away and, and very luckily to work close to home for several years um, because we had projects lined up. So, you know, typically in the golf business, you just go where the work is. Yeah. Um, but I was fortunate to kind of learn a lot of things close to home. And, and even though I was working a lot, you know, I was able to, to sleep in my own bed and, and all that. So I did that for several years. Um, and what and then was, had, what was, wait, sorry, what year was that that you started with Mark? That, that was 2001 coming right. back. Yep. Mm-hmm. So just went straight onto a tractor. He knew I had, you know, I'd gone to school and had interest in golf course design and things like that. Um, but I really just started out as a member of the crew and, um, and then, you know, progressed through increasing, uh, you know, responsibilities until, you know, he put, put me to work doing estimating and kind of project managing for, um, for projects. You know, and at the same time, I was doing side projects and landscaping and side projects and small golf course construction projects and doing, um, you know, it, looking back, getting a lot of experience by getting a lot of reps at small jobs, yep. doing different things. And then, um, you know, as I began to say in 2009, all that stopped and, um, you know, we're looking at each other saying, what are we going to do? And just by chance, the golf course where Mike uh, played most of his golf had fired their superintendent and they knew that he, you know, worked on golf courses. So they said, hey, could you could you help us with a temporary uh, solution until we find a new golf course superintendent? So that sounded better than having no job. And it was always something that I was very interested in. And, and you know, at that time, we were certainly just looking for a bridge to when we hoped there would be a recovery. So, so that was the first golf course you effectively started to manage. Yeah, that was Nakoma in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Right. And so I, so I became the superintendent, um, which I had not done, you know, formally before. I'd always worked on golf courses as a kid and, yeah. and had worked on the edges of it, but had never really done that. But dove in, and you know, for what it's worth, Nakoma is a very nice place, and um, you know, so it wasn't exactly a place where you could just 
figure it out as you go. I mean, we had to perform really well from the beginning. And thankfully, I started with an assistant, two assistant superintendents there, who one who had been there for 30 years and another who um, is still there and had been there for a number of years. And neither one of them let me uh, uh, screw anything up too bad. <laughs> so I had a lot of help at the beginning yeah. and some idea of, you know, having come from Scotland and, and just being around it yeah. on ways that we might do things a little bit differently. And it, and it, and it all came together and it worked very well at Nakoma in those first couple of years. And cool. so then, so then it wasn't a business until, um, I just wrote a cold call letter to a very cool golf course, uh, in central Wisconsin, uh, near Green Lake, Wisconsin, uh, Lasonia, well, which is a, uh, 36 hole facility owned by the American Baptist Association. And it's my favorite golf course in Wisconsin. We had always played there at least a couple times a year. And once I got into doing the management thing, um, I just wrote them a cold call letter and said, respectfully, I think it could be better. <laughs> and, you know, I, and just by chance, again, the timing was that they were, had essentially put their, their golf course manager on leave and were, were searching for a different solution. So then I appear and tell them that we can take care of it for them. So we had a contract within two weeks, I think. Wow. And that goes, that goes back you know, probably 12 years now. And that was the beginning of the management business from just doing it as a bridge to hopefully getting back into construction to, you know, we're pretty good at this. And, and now we have a second client, a good one, a prominent one that's hired us to do this. And from there, over the past 10 years, we've added, a, it hasn't exactly gone like this, but we've got 12 contracts now. So, you know, basically a contract a year has been the, you know, what I would call fairly measured growth Great. to this point with some irrational bursts but um you know that's that's where the company's at today we manage a, a dozen or so golf courses all of them in the midwest most of them in wisconsin but we have a few outliers in illinois and in pennsylvania and you're still doing uh, construction as well aren't you golf course yeah yeah so so you know in the way that it's all worked out um at, 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 I guess I don't know how far to back up, but the as a, well, at the same time that all of that's happening, um, I had been working on trying to get a, a golf course built in the sand dunes of Wisconsin, of all places, if you know anything about the center of uh, Wisconsin. Y you know, you don't necessarily expect to find um, giant sand dunes, but there there is a large belt of uh, sand that used to be a... Um, uh, the, the bed of a, of a glacial lake. Wow. Um, uh, there's a large lake in the middle of Wisconsin during the last, um, ice age. And yeah. that deposited these huge, um, sand beds, which eventually blew into sand dunes. But when we moved to Wisconsin, I didn't see anything, uh, in the golf courses that reflected any of that, or, you know, it seemed to me that that would be, a pretty cool place to do something so i started a very deliberate search and trying to find what i would you know what a, a place that i thought you could do that yep um that ended up being sand valley um and that all came together at the same time as we were starting the management company so right out of the gate we were doing that and then sand valley was coming together which ended up being um you know a tremendous commitment and you know the, the, the best thing that's ever happened to me professionally but we've now built two golf courses there um, and a part of three course and, um, you know, after finding land and helping them get started with some things, um, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to stay on there in a construction role. Yeah. And then, and then from there, um, you, you know, the design part of the business for me, which is why I got into all of it in the first place and is what brought me to Scotland. Um, I started to get busier with that again, with, with some of the credibility that was, you know, gained from Sand Valley. And I now find myself pretty busy on, you know, design build projects with, um, uh, we've done a few nice, large scale renovations of some courses um, around here. And so that that's now a primary, um, that's actually what, you know, demands most of my personal attention. I mean, that's where I'm spending a lot of my time uh, 
while we still have the the management company yeah. going, obviously too. Right, and you've come out, you've come down to Hobart as well, haven't you, to look at the I mean golf course, with Greg and. Yep. Yep, and it's our hope that if the timing can work out with the summers and winters and and all of the unknowns, that I'll be able to spend a big chunk of time there, hopefully with my family, to help yeah. Greg do something really neat. Um, yeah, looks like a, yeah. on what it, on what is easily the world's uh, very best golf course, most spectacular golf course site. I mean, people throw that around, but it's it, it, there's no more spectacular place that's going to get a golf course than what Greg has in our mend. It really is something. Yeah, it's at the head so, of the river in Hobart, uh, uh, where the Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race uh, finishes up. It's a wonderful tract of land. I think I remember Greg saying about five years ago, an American golf journalist was out. Greg showed him around and. Next morning, he wrote a blog post saying, uh, the, the journalist wrote a blog post saying, I've just seen the Sistine Chapel of World Golf. It, it, it's like that. I mean, it's um, for, for anyone listening who's, who's really familiar with golf courses, the only comparison I could make would be Old Head in Ireland, which is a golf course that runs along a peninsula with holes that hang right over the cliff's edge. Uh, Armand is like that, except it's much more... Um, amenable for actual good golf so i think it's it's um yeah whoever wrote that is right it's it's really going to be something well i think i'll have to start buying uh, buckets of golf balls right now uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm sure i'm going to lose a lot on that course as i do at bamboo as i do even at rapo yeah um yeah but it, it'll it'll be beautiful out there you won't be on you won't be sad it'll uh, it'll be great I'll be, I'll be happy sure. still as my balls drift into the ocean there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what age were you in 2001 when you started working with Mike? Uh, I probably would have been 24, 23 yeah. or 24 years old. Great. And then how did you transition? Because obviously you're an owner of the business now. Maybe talk a little bit about that from starting on the tractor in 2001 to, you know, becoming an owner. So, um, yeah, so I, I had... I had worked from the beginning for Mike, and as I said, you know, kind of in increasing with increasing responsibilities and and uh, you know when we started the management company, he and I did that very much together. But you know, he was doing uh, still busy in construction and and you know the the management thing I, I ran with pretty hard, and you know we recognized early that it would be advantageous for us to to. To maybe partner on the thing or I, I had reached that point you know where that's what I was seeking so we um, in 2013 I think we became 50 50 partners right yep. which are think are thinking there yeah you know, it's interesting you know the original proposal obviously was 51 49 yep. from Mike which I totally understand um, but before I even had a chance to react to it, he came back to me and said, you know, let's just do this thing 50, 50, which, um, you know, looking back is why it worked. Yeah. And yeah. even though we didn't do that for very long, that was, that was, I think, um, you know, that, that was good for both of us. And, um, there was some wisdom in that Yeah. because, because what that eventually ended up was it went well, Mike was seeking to, um, exit and he offered me, a buyout which we are now approaching the end of and you know i he's been able to finish doing what he's doing he's doing a soft retirement you might say you know he's yeah. still doing some projects but he's he's not day-to-day -day. he's never had to deal too much in the day-to-day -day with the management business and it's ended up being a a great thing for us so we we ended up at a you know i think a very fair deal and he financed basically the purchase uh, for me, and as That's I said, right. we're now yeah. three or four years. I, we're about to year five, uh, and at the end of it, you know, he will. I think he's happy, and 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 now we've got you know whatever whatever in front of us. Yeah, um, That's great. So vendor finance, he was happy to um, get paid out over the years. That's a really smart move. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I had no experience in any of that. Um, you know, I, I've never even worked in any type of corporate environment or anything. I mean, I've always, um, I, I'm not a, a stupid person, but I've never really, uh, it, it, even the, 
it had no grand ideas about how any of that would happen. Yeah. And yeah. thankfully was able to talk to a few people and keep it very simple. Yeah. And, right. mm. you know, it's worked. And it sounded like you've had a pretty good relationship. You and Mike had a good relationship, worked well together. And uh, he sounds like a pretty reasonable guy. Yeah, no, it's been great. And I'm, I'm sure there's been times that he's wanted to, uh, to strangle me, but, but, <laughs> you know, it's been, or, it, but, but it, yeah, it's been um, remarkably smooth and, you know, I, I guess we're somewhat complimentary in that he's a very detailed, um, you know, I guess I would, I would uh, be a little bit more on the artistic side. Got it. So in that way, doing some of these golf projects has, has worked out. Yeah. But, you know, I've tried to learn from that. And, and um, yeah, so it's been good. Yeah, great. Do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business? Um, well, on the, on the management side, so the... The way we work in management, we have, I guess, three different types of contracts. One is a, uh, where we manage courses for a straight fee. Uh, another would be a, a, a lease arrangement where we are at risk, where we're paying them a lease payment or some type of shared revenue deal, yeah. and we're at risk in business with them. And then the third is a maintenance-only contract, which is where we started, um, and is actually the cleanest business of all of them. Yeah. Um, where we're just a contractor and you pay us a fee and we deliver, you know, our, our hope is that we're delivering something that, that, that the clubs can't produce on their own or, yeah, and that it's a great value for them. So, so with all of that, we've grown to, uh, 10 contracts. We're in the neighborhood of like $9 million in revenue. Wow. And that's, yeah. that's the money we take in. If yeah. you look at the scale of, you know, what our very tiny office processes, you know, on all the various businesses, yeah. um, which might be a better uh, measure of activity. It's, it's two or three times that with all the ins and outs of the various clubs. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so there's, just, there's a lot of mess. It's, um, it's one reason why I say the maintenance is a little bit cleaner when you start operating these businesses, which are restaurants, banquet halls, golf courses, yeah. pools, and all of that, it becomes so much more complicated at each level. But both staff of the summer um, in our in our office in uh, in Plover. Otherwise, all the employees are out in the field at the various locations. Yeah, right. Yeah, you just broke up a little bit. Then I might just ask that question on FTE. How many? <laughs> so, what kind of full time equivalents across all those three areas of business would you say at the moment you're, you've got under management? Um, the, so I think during the summer we approached something like, uh, probably 400 full-time equivalent employees. Wow. Um, in the off season though, it's, it goes, it goes down. I think it goes down to something like 130. That might be high. I'm not, it, but, yeah. but it's something in that it, it's a seasonal business. So it ramps way up. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe give some context. Like when, when you started there in 2001, what kind of head count did Mike have? Uh, then well in, in 2001 you know the business i was working for was a straight um golf contracting business yeah so we would have had tens of millions of dollars in golf course i mean it, some of the just to give you a sense of the scale of the the projects it was not uncommon for us to have a 25 million dollar golf course yeah project yeah which you, you know, Greg will tell you is many multiples of what they hope to spend at arm and end to build the world's most spectacular golf course. So when you do these things as housing developments with gigantic landscaping budgets and infrastructure and roads and all that, the, yeah, the project all. costs can get huge. Yes. Yeah. So the number of people that were working in the business would depend totally on, you know, how many of those we had going on. But, but, you know, at one time, at the height of the company, you know, in golf construction, Mike had six or seven full-time superintendents that would have just been in charge of their own crews, building large golf courses, yeah. go doing large golf course projects. Yeah, right. Yeah. Great. Well, that's phenomenal growth, um, Craig, and also just uh, diversifying the business now from just construction through to uh, management and design. That's a, a wonderful growth journey. Yeah, it hasn't been by design, uh, and it all touch and it all touches golf. So you you could say it's not uh, maybe we're not that diversified, but yeah. it is. It does feel a lot better than just um, just doing one thing. 
Yeah. And, and and do you get out and play much golf yourself these days? Um, I, I had gotten to where I was not playing any golf hardly at all. And, it, and it's been, it's been, I guess a decade now of fairly intense workload yeah. and I just wasn't allowing any time for golf, which is, you know, and I love to play golf and, um, and that's why I got into it. You know, this year, um, Michael Kaiser, who is, um, who's the owner at Sand Valley, um, he, he uh, invited me to play golf this spring, several weeks, you know, two or three times in a row. And um, that has planted the seed that I'm trying to keep up with and play once a week. So we're, and I'm trying to do that, you know, within the company too, to get people to play out, play golf a little bit more. That's great. So, so reignited your passion for it again. Yes. I'm thankful that that has happened. And it's, and it's, um, you know, that with the virus this spring, we were all very busy, but, but very, um, constrained with what we could do and where we could go yeah and golf is uh is a pretty safe thing to do right now so so there's another reason why why you know that that that, that i think has happened but but it, it it's but to answer your question i was not playing any golf and now i'm uh, i'm trying to get back into it which is That's good. good yeah covid for me uh, kicked off my uh, golf game again a couple of three months ago now i was playing every couple of weeks with a mate and up at ratho last a uh, few weekends ago with a heap of mates it's a great game be playing and i'm really enjoying getting back into it yeah it's um and it's a, it's a good thing to do it's good for people to be at right now and you know i, I would never have believed this two months ago or three yeah. months ago or however long it's been but it's been a small golf boom in yes. our country yeah and... same, same in australia it's a lot of guys it takes over a month for us to book a tea time it uh the guy yeah. the mate i play with steve his golf course is just unbelievable golf yeah which is fantastic for the game of golf yeah so who would have thought but but um but that's good. And maybe it'll be a small reminder to people how good golf is and, yeah, and maybe right. they'll keep up with it. And to slow so, down a bit too. Yeah. And when, slow was, down. when was the moment you felt you'd succeeded? Um, well, I'll say the cliche thing, which is true. You know, I, I don't, you don't, I don't think you probably ever feel like that, but I, I, you know, saying I've succeeded, but I, I do remember when I um, felt like we had, we were doing something as a company um it, you know i think it's something that a lot of people when they when they start a business they're succeeding in providing a service or doing whatever or at least this was the way it was for me yep um you have to make a transition from doing it yourself obviously to hiring other people to do it um and walking away and in my case i was walking you know we were taking care of properties and i had a pretty good handle on everything that was happening and then because the business grew i had to become comfortable with knowing almost nothing about the properties and i had a lot of anxiety over that at the beginning you know and, and what we do is growing grass you know on the management side so i mean at the beginning i was obsessing over every thunderstorm that was passing these different locations and wondering how they were going to handle it yep. and um you know you can't obviously that's not productive and you just can't you can't do it so i had to learn that lesson and and i remember after a year of touring the properties and, and seeing that a lot of the same things that we were doing at our, at our first golf courses had translated uh, to our new contracts. So somehow we had institutionalized whatever it was, our magic formula for making these golf courses play great. Yep. We were kind of doing that and able to reproduce it. And I see now that we were kind of taking steps to make sure that happened. But at the time, it just, it just, it just baffled me. And I thought, I thought that was success. I thought somehow that's happening. And I, I just, you know, I wasn't sure how that could happen. Yeah. But, um, it, you know, and from there, when you get a little bit more comfortable with that, then you have higher expectations for yourself and yes. what the company can do and, and all that. So, yeah. And, and what does, success... and that would have been, that would have been probably three years in to when yeah. we were doing the management thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And what does success look like to you? Well, professionally success for me is um you know if i can get myself into a position where you're somewhat in control of the type of stuff that you're working on you know in control of your time and you're able to do that and to work on interesting things yeah. um and and still be able to pay the bills and that's you know i'm thankful that that's you know that's that that we've been able to get to this point where that's beginning to be possible um 
you know, and, and so that's professionally success to me is a lot about having control of the stuff that you're working on. Yes. And, um, yeah. you know, at a, at a success on a personal level is, is, is we've got, I've got two young kids, six and four. Yeah. And, you know, practically everything outside of work, you know, is just defined by them, by yeah. how they're doing. So, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, what about funding your business growth? Um, did you take any like bank finance on any uh, other investors come into the business or has it all been pretty much organic through the profits? No, it's just been, we've just, we, we did, we've financed the purchase through Mike, which was a great arrangement. And then we've paid for that just through organically through, through, uh, profits and growing the business. Yeah. Great. So, um, you know, we've never, we've never had any type of outside investment or anything like that. Um, yeah. So that, that was funding. We might talk, move on to the next one. If you were to start up today with plenty of, would you go into your industry? That's a tough one. Um, I would never discourage anyone from going into golf because I think it's, it's a fun thing to work in. And, uh, but, but it's not a, it, it, by any measure golf is in, um, some kind of decline right now. I mean, the, 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 the course closures far outpace new golf courses, rounds of golf are down. So there's, um, so it's, if I was just advising people generally, uh, uh kind of business to go into no i would not advise anyone to um necessarily to get into golf the same um you know i people are going to follow their passions and and the golf industry is made up of a lot of passionate people that enjoy working on golf uh and that's you know i love golf that's why i got into it so yeah so since it's such a strange thing i wouldn't want to discourage anyone from doing it but i but i there's probably easier ways to make money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Than, well, yeah. And can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Um, you know, the, mo the most, uh, most stressful time for us was we had several big clients. Um, it's probably three years ago. Um, get far behind in payments to us, you know, at the same time. And then we had a large tax bill due. So it was a perfect storm of several things happening at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, that hit me over the head, you know, all at once when I could have been um, much more aware of what was coming. Um, so, you know, it, we got through it and, and it, and it worked fine, but it, we got close enough to the edge where I thought, Oh man, this is, this is how easily this could all slip, slip away. Yeah. So, you know, I, it was just a wake up call for me to, to, to pay much closer attention to the, to the downside risk of any situation, you know, yeah. and just be hyper aware of the worst case. Yeah. Right. What, what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? For us, we were really bad at marketing from, um, you know, when we started the company, we were bad in every way. I mean, we were, we didn't market ourselves very much, which at that time was really just me working on it. I mean, I always knew the value of marketing, but had no experience in it. And then this might, you know, I, I found it basically distasteful to be out talking about ourselves all the time. And that's, um, I've had to get over that, you know, for us yeah. to be effective at all and selling what we do. And then more importantly, now that we're in a position to be selling or as importantly, now that we're in a position to be um, uh, marketing on behalf of other businesses, we've had to get much, much better. So for us, that's meant um, hiring someone who's, who's dedicated uh, just to marketing the golf properties. And then that's grown into, she has, um, that's a full-time position and she has a couple helpers now right. that get content and do other things. And that's, that's something that you, Troy and Greg, you know, both advised us on from the beginning, yep. you know, as a huge weakness of ours and we've acted on it. And I, I wouldn't say that we're, um, you know, probably never where we want to be, but we're light years ahead of where we were. And I think we're actually pretty good, you know, relative yeah. to our peers in marketing golf courses now. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great to hear. Yeah. I, on the podcast last week, I interviewed a subject matter expert on marketing, Tony Kibbe. And at the start, I repeated one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, which basically says, 
Uh, there's only two things in business that add value. That's marketing and innovation. Everything else is a cost. And it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's been interesting for us since we work at different locations, it, you know, in big populations and small, um, it, you know, I, marketing in a small population is very difficult and almost, um, almost impossible because you don't have enough well, you just can't cast the net very wide. We've been lucky enough to work in a couple of big population centers, and that's when you really see marketing go. You do something, and there's a cause and effect. People actually respond to it. Yeah. So, so you know, it's been good for us as we've gotten into some bigger markets that our competency in marketing has happened at the same time. Because if that had happened at the beginning, we probably wouldn't have been ready for it. But we had all of these lessons yeah. in very small markets and got a little bit better. So when we were actually reaching a lot of people, you know, we were, you know, we, we had better reserve. Yeah. Great. And what, what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Um, there's just, there's never enough time. Um, you know, that feeling that, that there's just never enough time, which, you know, you try to get better at. Um, but that's pretty hard to shake because there's just, there's just so much to do um, and you want to do it well. So uh, that's never been fun. You know, nagging voice that's saying, you know, you gotta, uh, there's just, there's just always something. So <laughs> it's not a very articulate answer, but it's, no, you mean it's, uh, it's a grind. Yeah. It's like an entrepreneur's curse because you love what you do. And I've spoken about this before in other podcasts that, double edged sword, you love what you do, therefore time flies, but it can also throw balance really out because I have a tendency to just keep working. Thankfully, my daughter came along seven years ago, it was her birthday yesterday, and I've got a chocolate Labrador and they both keep me uh, away from the laptop and uh, you know refocus my priorities in life um, because I could just keep working and working because I love 99.9% .9 of the things that I've done in the last 20 years. Yeah, and that's, that. and how fortunate, you know, you, you know we've both been to work on neat things but yeah it's consuming and if you don't watch it just it just eats up everything i've you know i've i've made those mistakes myself and i'm trying to get better at it and kids yeah kids um kids will do that to you really quick it, <laughs> it, um, yeah. it wakes you up but it's um but you know by any by any measure it's still a, a massive um amount of work even at, at this stage as we've been doing this a while yeah and and you know that that part of it is is great and that's fine it's just it's just trying to get more efficient and yeah and um saying no enough to things where you you just free up some space yes. for mm. for real life yeah so. and what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in the small business growth journey well this might sound negative or, or whatever but it, with the longer you're in business the more that you um realize the wisdom and guarding against you know the downside you know, you just want to understand where the home runs are versus, yeah. you know, the risk and getting that. That's something that, um, it, you know, you get better at the longer you're in business yes. um, mm. pretty quick, because if you don't, you just simply go out of business. But, <laughs> but, you know, in, in my world where there's a lot of, um, it, it, there's, there's fun projects everywhere. You know, they're all interesting. You know, it's, it, I'm not, I won't complain ever about working on golf courses or any of these, these things. It's, it's, it's engaging and fun work, but you have to be disciplined about that, about what you're going to pursue. And, you know, we've never made any catastrophic uh, mistakes in that way, but there's, there's projects that we've done that I've, that we could have spent our energy somewhere else and more productively. Yeah. And um, so I'm a little bit more on guard for that and say no a lot more and right. i didn't have any of that ability at the beginning yeah you know so that's that's been a big shift for me yeah it's a common trade i said yes to everything uh, myself and my business partners early on 20 years ago when we, when we started and that's uh, not wise yeah i'm still not very good at it but i'm a little bit better at it I'm getting so. better at it yeah and what is yeah. the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to de develop and maintain um number one habit well, this sounds very, um, this is just, well, I, I use lists like punch lists. Yep. Um, 
my I remember watching my dad growing up always had lists um, for every single thing that he did, you know, whether it was fixing things around the home or when he'd t- take me to his office, he'd always have lists, um, you know, of all the things that he was trying to do. And he was always crossing things off. And I guess that's that. Um, so I've always that that's been a habit that I've been able to be, you know, that I've always kept up. It's a basic thing. Um, yeah, where um, I fail is that yeah. I've never found any reliable or uh, I've never found a good system of category or keeping those lists in one place or, yeah. you know, but I am a list person. It might be on my phone. It might be on a yeah. scrap of paper. Um, so I'd love to find out, uh, you know, a structured way to achieve that. Maybe I'm going to give up on myself and just figure I'm just going to keep doing it this way. But, but I've always at least had the discipline to write things down and try to get stuff done during a day. That's great. It's, it's a lot of studies have shown that those people that plan their day and their week uh, are, achieve a lot more than those that just run off into the forest looking for trees as I like. Well, it doesn't take, yeah, and it doesn't take a lot. I no. mean, trust me, the things that I'm saying are like, um, you know, it's not a planned day or a detailed calendar, No. but just a handful of things that you can get done, um, yeah. you know. It's probably five, six years ago. I pretty much reverted to exactly that. I've just got a Google Doc. I call it my success list. I just write, you know, top five or ten things this quarter I want to knock over or achieve, and then break that down to the week and then down to the day, and just get into it. It helps me focus, stops me procrastinating. If I've got something not that fun that I have to not, you know, work on, it's it's top of the list. I've got to do it. Just get on with it. Yeah, really, really important. Yep. Uh, yeah. And even better if you take those lists and you're able to, you know, you get them on paper and then you start to see how you might prioritize things because things, yeah. a lot of things don't get done. So you want to make sure that you're, yeah. um, you know, for me, writing those things down has always, it's been helpful for that too. Yep. Great. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our kick-ass manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. And can you talk about how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, or advice for those listening? Um, well, we've been very fortunate in hiring, um, you know, Brian Jensen, who runs a management company with me and does almost all the day-to-day, was hired almost at the beginning of the company 10 years ago. I mean, basically when we got into managing golf courses, restaurants and the full general management, Brian was our first hire and now he is uh, running the whole thing and has been basically from the beginning. Right. Um, Ashton Giebert in our office started at exactly the same time, um, came in for an interview. We told her she could have the job if she said yes in a couple hours and she did. (laughs) And, um, and, and she's still there doing our accounting and HR and, so I just mentioned those there's, and there's many people with Mike Lyons, who's our, was our, my first hire as a golf course superintendent, you know, at another golf course, he's still there and is still our leader, you know, and everything on the golf course and all the guys, um, yeah. you know, still go to him with their questions and for resources and things. So, so we've been very fortunate to have people, um, stick around. We also, well, back to your earlier question on how my thinking has changed. Uh, one thing that we've always done very well is um, when we go into a property, we're often inheriting all the employees. Yeah. And, you know, the, the proposition with the client is usually, look, interview everyone. You, you, you have to make your own decisions. Um, sometimes they say, you do whatever you want. Sometimes they'll say, hey, we'd love to see it work with this person but they understand ultimately when they're hiring us, we have the ability to, to put a team in place. Yeah. I'm, you know, particularly proud of our record of being able to absorb teams and get great results. Yeah. Um, particularly if they're calling us, you know, we're entering situations where, where things may not be going very well yeah. and we're able to turn it around with much of the same staff in place. And I find that, you know, incredibly rewarding. Yeah. And I think, be. I think that's been the experience for the people that were not having a good time, you know, before we got there. And then when things are going better, it's just better to go to work. You know, that's great. And what are you saying that there there have been, there have been plenty of instances where that doesn't work. So again, as you get older and a little bit more mature, 
hopefully I'm quicker to re recognize when there's a real disconnect and, and there's just no hope for an arranged marriage, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but those, those things are, those, those, you know, those rare instances are still, um, still out there. And I think we're better at, at, at knowing when, when there's no chance for something working, but, but on hiring, we've, we've been fortunate to be able to inherit a lot of great people and to work as a team and, and to make things better as a team. As far as hiring off the street, um, you know, when I had, when we got to three or four golf courses, when we were growing, um, and I had exhausted all of my personal contacts, we had to start hiring off the street and that yeah. became very difficult. You know, that was, um, a completely different deal where you're, you have no connection at all. Yeah. You're, little people, you're doing your best. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, you know, I think we've gotten a little bit better at hiring and we do a few things now that we didn't do before, but that's still a very hard deal. Um, and I'm not sure anybody has it figured out. Yeah, it is. And just back on absorbing or taking over teams, that's an incredible, incredibly difficult thing to do. I went through it when I was at Lark, uh, you know, business. I had some, a manager that had been there 13 years, I think, another one that's six, a lot of staff that have been around. And often, um, you know, depending on the, where the business is going, uh, if it's going up and grow, going to continue to grow, a lot of the people that were already there aren't really well situated to take on the next chapter and you've got to you know make some of those hard choices and decisions but it sounds like you've done a fen phenomenal job being able to retain most of the people that you take the business over um working with that's uh, a very very difficult thing so yeah well we, you know we're, we're fortunate because even though a lot of our projects do involve even on the management side transition into a different to big construction projects or reimagining the golf course we're certainly not static in the way that we manage these things, we're always trying to make them better, but we are helped in the way that we are still providing a fairly basic service, which is providing a golf course in great condition, providing golf course general management that is predictable. And, um, you know, we're doing things the right way and we're handling things in a consistent way. It, it's the type of business that can be greatly improved by systems. Yes. Um, you know, it's not, once you have it figured out what the client is actually seeking is consistency. So shame on us if we can never achieve it. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, you know, for me in my role now in the management company, you know, I guess it's always been this way, but more so now, since I don't have as much time to spend on the day to day, I'm, I'm find myself to be the voice of moving initiatives forward, you know, kind of relentlessly. Yeah. So I can't offer as much on the day to day as I used to, but, you know, where I try to provide value is making sure that we're pointed towards whatever initiatives that we have going on at the different properties and that, you know, 12 months later, we're in a better spot that yeah. things are really, you know, and that's, that's been helpful for, I, well, I don't know, maybe it's been helpful for everybody because I'm more focused, you know, on something and can be, can be productive, but it's certainly been helpful for me mentally yeah, to put myself in that box where I'm not doing as much of the day to day if I can avoid it, but still, you know, focused on the other important thing, which is trying leadership. to get these places to make pro pro progress. Yeah, yeah, so. and showing real leadership. Yeah, yeah, from a, and often from a distance, you know, yeah. without without having as much time as you would love to have for each one of the properties. Yeah, so. right. Well, that kind of leads into what are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Because you've got a lot of people there involved in your businesses. So is that something you focus on, uh, the culture? Um, not in any, not as much as we should. I mean, there are some very basic things that we don't do that we could do a lot better. One of them is just getting together more often. Yeah. You know, I mean, just a culture of people knowing each other better. We're, we're spread across several properties. So I'm trying to remind myself, you know, constantly that we're not doing enough of that and, and, and hopefully we can do more. Yeah. You know, we did a lot of that when we were a very, very small company, very tight group, you know, of guys taking care of golf courses and they, everybody was having a lot of fun. And, and then we got a little bit bigger and we see each other less. And then we got even bigger than that. And there's a lot of people that I, you know, you wouldn't have to go that far to find somebody who doesn't recognize me or know, you know <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing. So, so, you know, that's all 
that's the next phase for us is trying to figure out how how you keep people connected to what they're doing um you know as the as the company grows yeah. as far as a culture i mean we have high standards i think if there was an overriding thing it would be that um our internal standards are meant to be um you know as high as achievably possible and we like to be in the position where our standards for the golf courses and what's happening out there um that we're ahead of problems before our clients bringing them to us yeah so wow. i i often tell our golf course superintendents that if we're in a greens committee meeting and a greens committee is like at a golf course there might be a board of directors that assigns people specifically to the golf course to keep oversight of the um of the people that are working on the golf course so yeah. we're reporting back to committees and you know from the beginning i've always told all of our people that if we're talking about grass in those greens committee meetings that are meant to be talking about grass then we're failing yes because you know grass is just what we do we're we're going to have a golf course that's in fantastic shape it's going to play great and you know we want to use that time to get together and talk about projects or things that move the golf course forward so yeah. culturally you know guys i guess our guys know not to start uh trying to use big words and yeah um you know science talk and all of that you know we keep things simple and just try to um try to do our jobs yeah. so i mean that as you can tell i struggle to to maybe tell you <laughs> <laughs> what you know what cultural things are but i mean we we're in a we're builders we maintain golf courses we manage them now yeah um you know we we have a culture of working hard and 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 trying to achieve high standards that's and great yeah and that's basically it how much professional development did you invest in yourself over the years, like books, podcasts, courses, training, conferences, events, anything about, I guess, managing the business growth? Um, well, I I drive thousands and thousands of miles. I'm always going. So um, a lot of that time's eaten up by phone calls, but I will, um, I will try to uh, listen to as, as, I, I listen to a lot of books. I used to read a lot of books. Now I now the majority of the stuff I'm reading, I guess, I'm actually listening to. Yeah. But um that's almost always business related. I um you know, I, I, I don't enjoy so much the um uh well I've read plenty of how to books basically on business and those things are important, but I do enjoy I mean find it entertaining and certainly find it relevant to hear the stories of other businesses and other ventures and other big projects and things like that. Yeah. Got so it. I find myself listening to more history and whatever, um, as much for entertainment, but you can grab a, a plenty of lessons from those things. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had mentors or coaches along the way in the, over the last almost 20 years apart? From obviously Mike would have been a, a big mentor for you, but any other mentors or coaches? Well, I mean, maybe not in a formal way, apart from just the relationship that we've enjoyed with you and Greg, Yep. um with experience consulting i mean you guys have done way more than you should have for us and and advised us on all kinds of things so but but formally that's really the only type of consulting yeah or professional development that we pursued that way yeah um well i've been very fortunate because of the jobs that we've worked on to work for some really remarkable people yeah. so in the past six or seven years the work at Sand Valley has put me um, in a position to be working with Bill Core, um, you know, of Core Crenshaw, who is um, huge who, in the golf, golf world. Yes, many people will say uh, he's the best living architect, and many people, including myself, will say he's as good as there's ever been. Yeah, wow. and um, so. You know, I would have never, have, honestly, I wouldn't have imagined that I would have, that I would ever have that chance. And, you know, when Sam Valley started in 2013, Bill was very generous with his time and he included uh, me and uh, Michael Kaiser uh, in all of his uh, early wanderings around the site and, and his approach to routing and, 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 and that experience for what I do and on the design side. Um, I don't, I, I know Bill didn't intend it that way, but for him to be, uh, 
you know, that was, that was as good as it gets to learn something about how to build golf courses. Yeah. Great. And I was, you know, and that continued on. Um, and I met David Kidd, who is fantastic and learned a lot from David and, um, Tom Doak is building the third golf course. And I've had the chance to meet Tom and get to know him a little bit on his site visits, but look forward to yeah. working with him on top of that. Um, Mike Kaiser senior is a remarkable guy. Um, yeah. If anyone has knows about him or read anything about him, he's uh, he's um, has a way of approaching not just building golf courses, but seemingly um, all kinds of things with a completely different perspective. Yeah, and you can't help but learn a lot on how to um, ask questions and and always be trying for a you know the best result, and and you just you, you see that through Mike and, and through his kids, Michael Kaiser, yep. who I admire greatly, mm -hmm. um, is just like his dad, Chris Kaiser. They're fantastic. I mean, these, I'm not, I'm not saying it very well, but I can't overstate Troy. Like that's a list of people that you could, um, that you can learn a lot from. Yeah. So I've been extremely fortunate that way. Um, the only, the only thing I, I have not had is, any type of training or peer group or whatever in managing golf courses. I think we could have done ourselves some favors by hiring someone who had worked in the industry yeah. for real before we really dove into it. Cause yeah. we learned a lot of hard lessons ourselves. Yeah. Um, could have used some mentoring in that, but we never did it. And, um, you know, we've made it, but, uh, but probably should have, <laughs> Could have found some 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 people to to help us uh, learn a little faster. Yes, yeah, yeah. You've always got twenty twenty vision in hindsight. Um, do you have a board of directors or advisors at Dollar Farm? No, it's um, it's uh, for better or worse, it's just me. So <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do like to ask people opinions. I mean, I'm I'm always listening. Yeah. And uh, we don't have any formal structure that way, but hopefully the company feels like it it's um you know when someone has a good idea they bring it up and we pursue it that's so true. yeah yeah that's great all right one of the final five questions what do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business um it's probably I, i've said it already but managing time is is a very hard thing to do yeah um it just consumes every minute that you have if you let it yeah. and, and not even if you let it it's actually what it demands yeah so um that's that's literally the hardest thing is that is that um there's just not enough time in the day <laughs> and favorite business book which has helped you the most you know there's a really good book um from written by scott adams and scott adams is the cartoonist who uh yeah. makes dilbert and i don't know if you if you ever heard him speak or have you read anything uh, from him no is he good oh he's a brilliant guy i mean really remarkable and he's written a, a few books all of them are good and there's one that's called um how to fail at everything and win big or something like that you'll find it if you if, yeah. you, if you look up th that and scott adams yeah and it is it is some of the very very best of all the like things that stick with you i've never read anything that has so many of those in a book and um so i would so it, I suppose it is a business book. It's got a lot of business and kind yeah. of um, career advice on things that, that skills that you might learn that will make yourself valuable to other people. Yeah, and, I'm going to throw that on my yeah. reading list right now. Yeah, it's very good. Yep. So any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? No, I would say I entertain myself, like I said, listening to books and whatever. Yeah. And I, yeah. I try to steer those towards business topics, but yeah. I'm not a regular listener to any podcast or anything. Yeah. But I'm a consumer of many things, I suppose. Yeah. And finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Yeah. If I was starting out, I would tell myself to, uh, this sounds corny, but to believe in yourself, yeah. um, to stick with, you know, I've never had a confidence problem, yeah. you know, in some, in some ways you just dive into things and, and all that. But, you know, when I say that, I really mean it, you yeah. know, you'll be challenged over and over and over again. And you know, the best results you're going to have in business are, are likely going to come out of, um, you know, those things that you 
whatever convictions you have that you hold most strongly. Yes. You know, you should, you should listen to that and act on it. And almost every mistake I've made, you know, is a, is a variation of getting away from that. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, you'd be advising people to just stick to your guns and don't change your plan or whatever. It's nothing like that. You're always listening. Yes. Um, you don't want to be stupid, but, um, but just believe in yourself and, and, and know that if you, if you, if you stick with that, um, you know, it's your best chance to have good outcomes. Yeah, you know, that would be my advice for myself. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thanks for your time today, Craig. I think the audience got a lot of value out of uh, the story you've shared with us, your growth journey. It's been uh, phenomenal growth and congratulations on almost 20 years uh, and some big wins. Yeah. Thanks, Troy. And for our audience, we'd greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 